Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Excellency, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you very much for this invitation. This is really a unique opportunity for me to participate in this London Defence Conference and to share with you some opinions and some thoughts about challenges we have ahead of us. So, ladies and gentlemen, on February the 24th, we woke up to a totally new reality. It was February the 24th, 2022. The Russian aggression forced many to redefine their sulfur policy. The thought of a war in Europe with indiscriminate killing of civilians, bombardments of residential buildings, schools and hospitals was hard to believe to many. And still, that is exactly what happened after the 24th of February last year. I wish to remind you that, unfortunately, it's nothing new for Russian imperial policy. Central and Eastern Europe remembers the terror under the Russian occupation at the time of the Iron Curtain. We also recall the wars in Chechnya, Georgia, and Moldova, which followed after 1991. Therefore, the current aggression against Ukraine and the attempt by the Kremlin to suppress the sovereignty of the Ukrainian people comes as no surprise to us. As early as 2014, we knew that Russia would not stop in Crimea, Donetsk, and Lugansk. Ladies and gentlemen, in a broader view, the aim of the Kremlin is to regain control over the so-called post-Soviet zone and destroy the current world order. For Putin, the West was weak and disunited. There were a few reasons of that assessment. The major ones were political and economic factors. The West was afraid that the strong reaction might cause big turbulences in political relations. Moreover, many states were concerned about losing lucrative contracts with Russia. Many in the West fooled themselves thinking that in the area of extensive economic connections, gigantic product, projects such as Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, it would be impossible to make a step further and take a decision to invade, which, should, which would shatter all of that. Meanwhile, Russia was testing for decades how far it could go using its various forms of aggression and how much the West would allow it to do. Ladies and gentlemen, expansion. Expansion, that is exactly the priority of the Russian policy. An attempt to subdue others by means of blackmail, conquest, force and terror. The Kremlin is ready to pursue a goal no matter what the cost. For those who still have doubts if Russia stops in Ukraine, let me remind the words of the former Russian president Medvedev, who said clearly, the aim of the war in Ukraine is to undermine the current world order built after the Second World War and establish the new one. He has said, I have no doubt that this new world order would be against the values that are of importance to us. It would be based on aggression, fear, and total control. There would be no respect for freedom of citizens, the value of human life, the rule of law, and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, we must redefine, once again, the so far perception of threats. 
this moment is especially crucial for Europe, which has to stand up to the biggest challenge since the, since, since the Second World War. We must to be united in showing that we do not accept an aggression in the 21st century. We have to stress loud and clear that we do not agree to the violation of international law which we have established based on our shared values of freedom, equality, sovereignty and independence of nations. Let us also bear in mind that today's conflict in Europe has a much broader dimension. <coughs> Russian aggression has global consequences. It's brought by the crisis Russia has caused the energy and food ones. They, they affect Asia, Africa, and the Middle East alike. In the long term, this crisis will spill over and impact all regions of the world, ruin our economies, and hinder the development of states. Our resolute response should also be a signal to those who adhere to different principles and are inspired by the Kremlin's activities. Weak opposition will serve as an incentive for those potentially aggressive countries to start actions in other regions of the globe which may be harmful for all of us. That's why our response has to be swift, strong, and efficient. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Poland understands this perfectly well. That's why, since the launch of the Russian invasion, we have been supporting Ukraine in international forums, seeking backing for Kyiv as well as condemn condemnation and sanctioning of the Kremlin. We have been supplying extensive aid both in Poland and in Ukraine. Let us remember that more than 15 million people have left Ukraine since the outbreak of war, of which almost 12 million crossed the border with Poland. Most of them are elderly persons, women, and children. They found shelter in Polish homes, welcomed by Polish families, and not in refugee camps. Frankly, there was no need to build refugee camps because all the people who came from Ukraine, they found accommodation among Polish families in Polish houses in Polish homes. Thank you very much. Over the last year, we were able to set up a huge logis logistic hub in Poland, which allows for the transfer of humanitarian and military assistance to Ukraine. For those who were not willing to leave their homeland and whose households were destroyed, we had established, along with our British friends, a temporary container town in Lviv. However, as I said before, we are not going to bring the hostilities to an end by means of political and humanitarian support only. Hence, Poland is one of the biggest suppliers of military equipment for the fighting Ukrainians. Up until now, we have provided over 300 battle tanks, hundreds of infantry fighting vehicles, artillery systems, mortars, and anti-aircraft capabilities. We have equipped thousands of Ukrainian soldiers with Polish-made Grot assault rifles and millions of ammunition shells of various types. We were also one of the first states to hand over our MiG jets to Ukrainian pilots. These aircraft allow them to protect their skies against Russian attacks. 
with the fights ranging in Ukraine, we, along with other partners, continue to train new Ukrainian recruits as part of the EU mission. Having said all of that, I wish to thank the United Kingdom for all its involvement, support, and most importantly, for joining the tank coalition. Ladies and gentlemen, after the victory, we will face the task of holding the guilty ones to account for the war crimes committed. We will also have to help Ukraine to reconstruct the country. I count on Poland playing a leading role in this respect as we have re relevant assets which will facilitate the process. What I mean is first of all our geographical as well as social and cultural proximity. What is more, we know what kind of reforms are required in state that was politically and economically dominated by Russia. It's also part of our history. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation across the region forces us, like never before, to join efforts in strengthening the North Atlantic Alliance, which needs to deter the aggressor effectively. Of key importance in these respects will be the Vilnius summit decisions. Poland has the following priorities. One, boosting the defense potential of the eastern flank by increasing the number of NATO troops deployed there. Two, reforming NATO response force along with the Madrid summit decisions by implementing the new force model and scaling up the high readiness forces from 40 up to 300,000 troops. Three, establishing a multi-corps land component command in Poland based on the oper operational command and for motivating all allies to increase their defense spending. And let me stress, all allies. We must bear in mind that NATO forces are not just the US troops. It's our joint potential contributed by each and every member of the alliance. Let me recall that if we want Article 5 to provide ironclad security guarantees, then the provisions of Article 3 have to be strictly, strictly followed. And Article 3 stipulates that every one of us, each NATO member, has to individually maintain and develop the capacity to resist armed attack. <coughs> In order to effectively deter an aggressor, what we need is not only the effort of the alliance as a whole, but also our own one. We keep bolstering our defense potential in order to meet allied commitments. We are spending on defense, preparing modern legisl legislative solutions expanding and modernizing our armed forces, forming new units and providing them with modern equipment integrated with that of our allies. At the same time, we take note of emerging threats. That is why we continue to develop our capabilities across all domains, including especially in cyberspace. All of it is costly, but the Polish society understands why we are developing our armed forces and why we are helping Ukraine by supplying with it with part of our equipment. For Poles know perfectly well that the cost would be even higher if Ukraine lost. I'm glad that we are not alone and we are developing capabilities along with our strong allies. 
Polish-British military cooperation is historically important and it goes decades back. Currently, our forces are involved in allied operations and exercises around the globe. Polish soldiers serve in NATO commands in the UK, whereas the British ones do the same in Poland. In 2022, British engineering troops helped to protect Polish border in the aftermath of the Belarusian hybrid attack. Moreover, starting this year, we have a British company of Challenger 2 tanks deployed in Poland, as well as soldiers stationed together with the Sky Sabre air defense system. We are implementing a number of bilateral projects as part of the military technology collaboration. And by doing so, we maintain a dialogue which contributes to a stronger industry and more robust defense capabilities. Together we can do more. Therefore, I appreciate the so far engagement of the British on the European continent, both on bilateral as well as allied level. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, the challenging international situation today requires our involvement also beyond our region. We must start to talk together with the countries of the global south, especially Africa. I see a special rule for Poland in this respect, whom they consider a credible partner. Lack of my country's colonial past might help us all in this context. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in order to restore the global order based on our shared rules of equality, respect and sovereignty with respect for international law, we must respond to aggression in the un united way and discourage anyone willing to try and change the world by force. Europe must stay united and help Ukraine. It's only with our help that the end of this war will be possible. It's only with our help that those guilty of the committed war crimes, rapes, murders, the destruction of houses, hospitals and schools will be held to account. We must also be open towards other regions in the world. In this way, we will be able to jointly bring back stability and international security. I thank the United Kingdom for its cooperation to ensure security in Europe. Thank you for supporting Ukraine and for your clear stance on the Russian aggressor. We are strong in the alliance. We are strong together. Thank you very much.